Hey folks, how's it going? This is Seth Williams, and you're listening to the RE Tipster Podcast. This is episode 180, and today I'm talking with my friend Neil Clements about all things subdividing. So Neil is a phenomenal example of a land investor who has been killing it in the subdividing niche. I got connected with him a few months back when I was looking for the subdividers in the RE Tipster community, and I got on a call with him. And in an hour and a half or so, he just blew my mind. He gave me an incredible education about how subdividing works in Texas. I asked him tons of questions and he just nailed everything and really made it make sense for me. And uh, I wanted to share the love with all of you here. And Neil was willing to do that. And uh, we're going to be going through this process of I'm going to do what I do best, where I just try to pick around and ask as many questions as I can to really try to understand the full scope of what's going on and how this works and who this isn't, isn't for and, and on and on. And, uh, I think we're going to have a good time here. So Neil, welcome to the show. How's it going? Great, Seth. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, absolutely. So for those who don't know you, why don't you tell us your real estate investing background? When did you get into land and what were you doing before that? Yep. So I came out of college and immediately went into real estate. It's one of the only things that I've ever done. And so that looked like for me starting off as a real estate agent um, about eight years ago, and then went to be a mortgage broker, went back to be a real estate agent once I moved um, from one part of Dallas to another, and quickly uh, found myself flipping houses with a partner, uh, doing rent houses, flipping houses. And that was near COVID time about three years ago. And so we had a very successful house flipping business, scaled that up very quickly. First year did about 20 flips, second year did 30 flips and wanted to keep scaling from there. Until recently, um, early last year, early 2023, um, took a one month sabbatical, went to the beach with the family, um, worked part time, even though I had a, a team back here in DFW that was still working and really looked over the whole business. Where were we successful? Where were we not successful? Especially with the market recently changing um, and some deals looking like really good deals that we had bought that were no longer good deals now, now that the market had shifted late 2022 going into 23. And looked back and saw that most of our profits came from land deals. And it's not that we had done a ton of them. We had done maybe a handful of them. But you looked. I looked at the profit that came from the land deals. I looked at the time that it took to do the land deals. I looked at um, how much did we have to spend to renovate the properties and had this epiphany that, oh my gosh, we're focused on the wrong thing. And so came back, shifted our team of cold callers, our operations, everybody that we have on the team and just said, you know, let's have one singular focus. And instead of trying to do a lot of different things in real estate investing, let's go all in on land and specifically on land subdividing. So I um, had an excellent year last year and uh, looking forward to a really good one this year. Wow, awesome. So you took the Land Investing Masterclass, right? If I remember correctly? I did, yes, okay. I did. Sweet. So did you start off just doing straight up land flips and you're like, okay, I'm done with this, let's go on to subdividing? Or did you get into this knowing like, okay, subdividing is where it's at, that's what I'm gonna start with? Yeah, so I probably, I started off different than most people on a few different aspects. So first off, it, it was the second thing you said, which is I started off subdividing. And mm -hmm. the reason I did it that way is because the first time we bought uh, our first handful of flips actually had four to five acres on them. And so uh, we came across land deals very early in our house flipping business and quickly found out that this, I guess, ingrained concept in the land, just like it is in houses, that the smaller land that you have, the more price per acre that you've got because you have more demand, more people can buy it. The bigger land that you have, the lower price per acre you have. There's less marketability, there's less demand, therefore you can't sell it as much per acre. And so it's the same with houses. Um, lower square footage equals higher price per square foot and vice versa. And so taking that similar concept from house flipping just to land, we started to find that there were opportunities out there where, for instance, maybe you could buy 20 acres for 10,000 an acre and then sell one acre lots at 50 to 75,000 an acre. And to put that in perspective, that's a purchase price of 200 and the sales price of five to 700 with not a lot of renovation needed in between. And now, obviously, that's a home run deal that doesn't happen every single transaction, but that's the power of subdividing. And so we got into subdividing specifically to look for subdivide deals. 
and not necessarily to look for properties that were extremely undervalued. Because I mean, we're in the fastest growing metro in the nation being DFW. And, you know, trying to buy properties that most of the people out there say, you know, buy it at 40%, 50%, even 60% for the size of properties that we're purchasing, you know, people just laugh at us. And we've, we've spoke to in our cold calling efforts about 20 to 30,000 people last year. And I, I can't tell you once that we even got a deal at 70 or 80% of market value, even though we actively offered at those amounts. Anyways, we, we came into it looking to subdivide and add, add value to properties. So what, like what percentage of market value are you buying them at? Like 90%, 80% or hundred percent or? Yeah. So there's, the, so there's two ways to look at, it. I mean, let's tackle subdividing a little bit, then I'll explain how we look at it. So mm -hmm. there's one area of subdividing where you can do big lots meaning that you you essentially take 50 acres and a 10 acre lots. You don't have to have any kind of approvals, no county involvement, an exemption. So that's easy because you can you don't have any risk. Like you can literally just survey it. You don't have to wait for anybody to approve it. So on something like that, yeah, we can typically offer up to 90% of market value, potentially 100% of market value, just depending on the if the spread hits where we want it to hit. I'll tell you about that in a second. The other aspect of it is a platted subdivision where you have to get county approvals. And the reason that that's different is because if we go out there and say pay 100% of market value or 90% of market value for a property, having to have a platted subdivision doesn't mean we get automatic approval. And so therefore, it's not like on the big ones where we can just say it's actually worth, say, 30% more. It's not worth that extra margin until it's actually approved. And so therefore, we either have to wait till it gets approved to close or we get to take that risk. But mm -hmm. to backtrack here, your original question was, how do we calculate offers? So we don't like to pay over market value, don't like to pay over 90 to 100% of market value. But truly, our main margin is we want to have a 30% margin, gross profit margin on every deal we do. And what that looks like for us is we've got to buy at 60% of the after repair value. And so that leaves 10% cost for expenses. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we... We pay more attention to what we can make the property worth more than what the property is currently worth. And, you know, I liken that to apartment investors or to people who buy businesses who are, are not necessarily paying as much attention to what the property is worth in current condition based upon occupancy, based upon revenues, whatever they're evaluating. They're going to look at what's the future potential, what it's going to take to get there and how much money is it going to take, how much time, how much risk and calculate it based upon the after repair value. And so similarly, we've we've put that approach towards lands investing. And so that's more of how we calculate it is, what is it going to be worth after we do this subdivide? And how much money is it going to take to get there? So the uh, in this whole thing of figuring out what your offer price is versus the you know uh, improved or after a subdivision value of that property. So how do you know when it is or isn't worthwhile to subdivide at all? Like, say, if you were to buy a 40 acre yeah. parcel, split it up into four and, you know, the the net proceeds of that or, the, you know, the, the sale of the child parcels ends up being not that much more than what you could have sold the original parcel for. Is there some kind of ratio you're looking for? Like, like what kind of increase do you need to see in the child parcel versus the parent parcel in order to justify your involvement in doing this? Absolutely. I mean, there's there's no set in stone number. My number I'm looking for is a 30% gross profit margin. And so that's mm -hmm. just specifically running your net numbers versus what you sell it for, or 60% of what it's worth after you subdivide it. And that's how I calculate the offers. But to answer your question another way is there has to be there has to be a difference in price per acre between a smaller lot versus a bigger lot and a county. And so we actually started recently running our numbers, you know, differently. Previously, when we were targeting counties, you know, we just went into a county because of proximity, you know, because we can drive there, essentially. You know, it's within three hours of DFW Metro. And so we said, okay, here are 20 counties we can target. Let's call all of them. And very quickly, we learned by doing that is that there are some counties that you have that spread. Again, kind of like we said maybe 10,000 an acre on bigger pieces, you know, 10 to 20 acres, 50 acres. And on smaller pieces, you're at, say, 20 to 50,000 an acre. There's, there's a clear, massive value spread between lower acreage and bigger acreage, because that's how we create our profit. And so 
that's one reason to do it. So the second reason to do a subdivide would be to sell a property easier. And so, although not more profitable, you know, there, in almost all circumstances, there is more demand for a 25 acre lot than there is a 50 lot in most places in the US. You know, 25 acre lot, 50 acre lot versus 100 acre lot, uh, one acre lot versus 10 acre lot. You know, however you want to slice it up, there is more demand at the lower end. And so you either do it for profit or you do it for days on market to be able to sell it faster. But if we're going to take on a subdivide, it's going to be for profit and it's going to have to be a very, very sizable chunk because mm -hmm. the properties that we're looking at buying, our average purchase price is in about $350,000. Um, our average after repair value um, is just about maybe one and a half times to double that. So you know, anywhere from 550 to about 750. And so we're not necessarily looking for um, skinny deals. Yet another question you asked earlier about, you know, how, how do you know when to subdivide things like that? Subdividing, it's not right for everybody. And the other thing that I will tell you about it is that it's rare to find a good property that can be subdivided. Um, and we can dive into that. What, you know, what do those properties look like? But it's, it's not easy to find. Let's say that. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe we should get into that. Like, and I know this this probably differs from state to state and area to area. Because I know in Texas, like, the availability of water is a huge deal. That is not a big deal in other parts of the country. But, and that's just one example. But like, when you're looking for the perfect parcel to subdivide, or maybe when you're putting together your list of property owners to contact, uh, whether it's direct mail or cold calling or however you do that. So, like, what does your you know perfect property look like? And what kind of stuff would you just be like, absolutely not. This is never going to work. Don't even call them. Sure. So you're looking for the needle in a haystack. I will tell you that. The difficult part that we have found in running these properties is that you have to hand sort them. In most of the areas, if I'm using DataTree or some other list provider, um, they're not going to give you, for instance, road frontage um, as the main, the main ideal, the main goal that you want to have because... When we talk about subdividing, if you're talking about wanting to put in roads, you want to install utilities, you want to do all that, well, you better have some deep pockets or you better have some good relationships with people who do. Yet the subdividing that we like to do already has the roads in place, for the most part, already has the utilities in place, being water and electric, and has the ability to, without, you know, with minimal effort, say ten dollars or $20,000 or less, has the ability to be instantly marketable. And so that's what we're looking for. Um, floodplain, in a lot of instances, kills that. Um, obviously, steep contours kills that. So we're we're looking for the properties that we can instantly market as smaller. That is the best way to say it, because otherwise, you're not necessarily doing a minor subdivision. Uh, you start to get into a major subdivision, which takes a lot of time, effort, and money, and and a lot more risk, in my opinion. So it sounds like this isn't the kind of thing where you just, you know, go to Daily Tree and say, yeah, give me everything, I don't know, vacant land, 40 acres and up, and go. Like, you have to download it and then open up land ID or something and go parcel by parcel and look at it and be like, does that make sense? Yes or no? Because you got to understand road access and utilities and a lot of stuff you just can't really know without looking at it, right? That's correct. And and that's what makes it so difficult. And that's what kind of isolates the opportunity to the select few who are willing to do it. And so yeah. we still, we don't only prospect for subdivides. We're, I mean, we'll still prospect for properties that don't need subdivision. Um, however, you know, out of the, I think we bought 15 properties or so last year, those amount of properties that we bought, there was only one that was not a subdivide opportunity. And so to give you an idea, um, I mean, the competition in our marketplace, and maybe this is everywhere, I don't know. I only target, you know, North and East Texas, Dallas, um, Fort Worth, and Tyler. But the competition in our marketplace is just unlike anything I've seen. Now, I will say it's not as intense as house flipping or wholesaling, yet I, I did not expect for land investing to be this intense and for every single phone call we do to have to even... For instance, if we give an offer at 100 percent of market value, to even have to convince somebody that that's market value and to take it. Yeah. Mm. So that, I mean, that's that's the struggle. You, you know, you would think if you're not in this industry or if you've never given offers that good, 
you know, you would think giving somebody 90 to 100 percent of market value that they would all just jump for joy and be like, oh, yeah, where do I sign? And the reality is in hot market areas like I work in, a lot of times that's still not enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what do you think that is? Because I'm pretty sure it's not that case everywhere. Like you could make an offer. for. I don't think it's that case everywhere. Value. Yeah. So like, is this just because it's Texas and it's growing like crazy? And and I do think there are a lot of land investors there because of the relative ease of subdividing and, and that kind of thing. But I don't know, is it just because it's uh, one of those hot markets out there? Yeah. I mean, if you look at a lot of people still have, I guess, COVID mentality and not the disease yet COVID mentality and the fact of they think their property is going to get 10 offers in three days and sell for 10% above market value with no effort. And the reality is, is that since late 2022, that that's, that's not what's going on. And so a lot of times we're in an uphill battle on what people perceive their property to be worth. And even after we're able to talk to them about what that looks like, they just, they just don't agree or they have a reason they want to hold on to the property. The other thing that we don't encounter much, we're encountering almost no distress, which is extremely foreign to me because, you know, in house flipping, that's that's the name of the game mm -hmm. <laughs> is, yeah. you know, somebody has a rundown property condition. Somebody's in a hardship such as foreclosure. Um, somebody needs to sell a house quickly for some reason or another, you know, and in, in land, especially in our area, with property values have shot up so high so quickly. I mean, most properties in our area have doubled over the past three years from what they were previously worth. So I think that there is just a lag between market perception and what people expect to get for their properties. Mm -hmm. Do you ever even start the conversation of like 50% of market value or does it just start at 80% and go up from there? Oh, it, no, I didn't even start at 50. I mean, we've, it's hard to say, but we even have people laugh us off the phone at 90% of market value. Wow. And, and I'm not saying that lightly. I mean, we, we have two American cold callers in our office um, who are my acquisitions agents that make the calls and they lock up the deals. And we found that to be the best, the best possible callers on the phone for the type of properties we deal with. And even with that, I'm continually surprised every single day for about the past year, how often, you know, we just sit and look at each other like these people are absolutely insane as far as what they expect to get for their property. And the other difficulty that we have is, and maybe this is everywhere, but in North and East Texas markets, it, it seems like land sellers and land real estate agents, they price their properties at just ungodly prices. You know, if a property is worth 10,000 an acre, they'll list it at 25,000 an acre and they'll flood the market with all these bad listings. And so anytime we're negotiating with somebody, oh, you yeah. know, we have to try to show them sold comparables and they just don't want to hear it, especially in Texas, because they can't see that data. So all that all they have is to go on is us because we're, we're real estate agents. We have access to it, mm. but it's difficult to convince somebody in these areas to even sell for market value much less 10 or 20 percent off market value wow it's fascinating it, has it always been like this or is this something you're seeing like this year in 2023 or 2020 i don't know i'm relatively new to the game of straight land investing and and not house flipping and so even though we've had immense success even though we've you know done quite a few properties at this point even just in the last year uh, i can say that this is all that i know and we didn't expect it to be this way, you know, especially based upon the education and the content that we'd absorbed and preparation for making this change. We didn't anticipate it to be this hard. Now, a lot of people on the on listening to this are probably going to say, oh, yeah, you should have known. But, you know, everything's harder when you actually start trying it. Yet, truly, I thought it'd be easier. And and maybe it is in other areas. And that's maybe a point that you're trying to make is is maybe there are other areas of the U.S. that are good for these subdivides that don't have as much competition. And I'm definitely all ears if somebody knows of some areas. As I'm hearing you say all this stuff, it, it does make some sense. I mean, Texas is like fastest growing, has a lot of stuff going for it. It's relatively easy-ish to do these kind of minor subdivides anyway. Not that there's not obstacles, as you know, but like there's a lot of reasons why the stars and planets align and send a lot of people that direction. 
But uh, we actually had a conversation with uh, David Hansen. I believe it was episode 176. He works in several different states, and he's always doing like the platted subdivisions where it's, it's a major subdivide. Sure. It's very involved. And he's kind of a genius at figuring out like what is the best possible way to carve up these parcels so that we can get as many in there and have green space and sell this whole thing for the, you know, as much as you possibly can. I think it still has a lot to do with the market, but is your preference to go after minor subdivides? Like if oh, you could absolutely. Have your way. Absolutely. So, yeah. And I wonder, yeah. like, if things would shift, say, if it was the other way around, it's like, no, my specialty is platted subdivisions. I'm not afraid of spending over a year to get this thing done. Like, I'm the best at this and I will figure out how to make the most out of it. Like, if you all of a sudden had that competitive advantage, this would be a lot easier because you can create money out of thin air by just being willing to go through these, you know, difficult steps and having the expertise to do that. That's what David's situation is. But it sounds like you're more like a... a normal person where you don't necessarily have that civil engineering expertise and you don't, you don't want to deal with all that stuff. I certainly wouldn't, but I don't know. I wonder if maybe it's just about changing that recipe a little bit in order to find that competitive edge that most other people don't seem to have. Yeah. I'd be curious to know with David on what that looks like, because I know that there are instances, for instance, where we can pay say 150% of market value, where we could pay 200% of market value. The instances are varied. It is all for him. I'm sure it's all about after repair value. You know, what is the value when I've done? It doesn't matter what it's worth now. The constraints for me is that when I'm getting a bank loan, my property still got appraised. And so a lot of these banks aren't necessarily, they're not seeing the same value as I'm seeing it as, as a subdivision because you know, they may acknowledge that the subject property is 50 acres, but they're not going to value it as five, 10 to acre lots, even if I send them the surveys. They just don't want to take the risk on that collateral. And so as opposed to if you have a major subdivision, you have a plat in place, you have all those approvals. Well, hey, now a bank looks at it as a completed platted subdivision. Hey, you know, it, it is different. And so that could be it. And, and could it be possible that he's coming in here, somebody like him is going after these exact same properties that I'm going after and just doing more work on them, such as a major subdivide. Hey, it's very possible. Yeah. And I think, uh, I don't want to speak too much for David, but I believe what he said was uh, like, they don't even get into this until they know they have a national builder who's like ready to buy up everything. So it's like that by is. the time they're closing on it, like the deal is sort of done in terms of getting the thing sold. So maybe that gives a bank a different kind of insurance when it's like, Hey, this thing is literally worth this. Like, here's the purchase agreement. It's done. Yeah, that's super smart. I mean, my my model would differ in the fact that I'm looking to stay as nimble as possible and moving, looking to move as quickly as possible. And so, you know, most of our minor subdivisions, uh, from the time we go under contract, we close within, say, 45, 60 days. And then we're only holding them for at maximum of six months. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, we were not necessarily installing a ton of utilities. We're not installing roads. And so beyond the purchase price of the property, you know, we're not shelling out a ton of capital. And so for me, as I'm growing this from, you know, nothing to something to something awesome, you know, mm -hmm. kind of this uh, first, second year of getting into it, my priority is capital return and quick capital return so that I could actually go out there and maybe do some of those bigger deals. but. Right now, I'm trying to build a capital stack so that I have the opportunity to wait for a year, you know, to to do one of those major subdivides. Because uh, right now, that would just it would just wouldn't be in the cards. So you may have already said this, but maybe we should talk about just some typical numbers on this thing. So, like, what is a typical acquisition price and the typical disposition price? What you're selling it for in the end? And I think you said it takes six ish months if it's a minor subdivide. Is that right? Right, exactly. And that in the six ish months is specifically just days on market. It, it's specifically just advertising time for either going on market with a realtor or actually trying to sell the properties. And so, you know, there's very little time a week at most just to really coordinate your photographer, maybe get property mode, maybe clear some frontage, you know, just, just some basic stuff that really doesn't take much time. And so with that, you know, average numbers, if we're just trying to look at, you know, what is what does this look like on an average basis? I'll give you an example of what I think like a good a good deal would be. So and this is just an example of, of a deal that we're working um, east of Dallas um, in, a, in a smaller county. Uh, we're purchasing for a hundred thousand. 
and we're selling it for 260000 We've got it out of water line, so we're doing about 35000 in repairs. And um, all in, our net profit on that is going to be 107000 after you take out about 10% or so for real estate agent fees, closing costs, and holding costs. And so, you know, I would consider that an excellent investment. Profit is 40, 40% of ARV in that circumstance. And that's what I would consider for what we're doing a very average deal. You know, not necessarily a home run, home run, yet also not a single. You know, you know so somewhere in between, double, triple, like a good, a good, solid, healthy deal. You know, that's kind of what we average. Uh, some of our bigger deals, we're, we're looking right now at a deal that's, you know, we're buying for a million um, and we're going to do a major subdivide on it and ultimately make it worth about two and a half million. But that's going to take two or three years. And so there are stuff like that that we are doing yet, you know, that's really the one offs. Those are the home runs. Those are the once a year, once every other year properties that you actually get to to see on it. But my average minor subdivide is only maybe three or four lots. It's not that bad. It's, if, if you know the challenge, the challenge is finding the properties, right? I mean, because if you can find the properties and you can get them under contract to get a value, the actual end subdivide is not really that hard, especially if you have a good real estate agent you're partnering with, a good surveyor, a good title company or attorney. You've already got really everything you need to do the deal and to do it right. But where most people get in trouble with subdivides is, is specifically just having a lack of knowledge on what can be subdivided and it cannot be subdivided. Where people get in trouble is they buy a property thinking it can be subdivided without actually having discussed with anybody. Then they go to actually try to subdivide it, figure out they can't, and then now they're either upside down or they're just selling the property for break even. So that right there... <clears throat> What would a person need to do to avoid that, to buy a property thinking they could subdivide it and then realizing they can't? Like what questions need to be answered for them to be yeah. 100% sure they can do what they want to do? Yeah, I mean, so you've got to figure out who, who's going to give you approval. And so, and do you need approvals? So for instance, if we're talking about Texas, you're 10 acres plus, there's a full state exemption that says if all your resulting lots are 10 acres plus, then you don't have to get any formal county approvals or, or anything like that if you're outside of city limits. Now, if you're inside of city limits, you're always dealing with the city. You know, that could change depending on jurisdiction. And so you've got to figure out what governing body has authority over your land. And are you going to be subject to what their rules and regulations are? Or are you going to be exempt? The second thing you need to do is verify all utilities. In Texas, that means water primarily. Water is the big issue here, like Seth alluded to. Electricity, not as big of an issue, but still, we got to make sure it's there. And then you got to make sure your other basic due diligence for buying a piece of land, you know, easements, floodplain, et cetera. But the biggest thing that I would say for somebody looking to subdivide is you've got to add a layer of due diligence into your process of buying that you don't previously probably have, which is county approvals, city approvals, and what is that all going to look like? And then if you're not verifying utilities, such as water and electric on these properties, for subdivides, you're going to want to, because especially if you're subdividing into smaller lots, you're probably selling to somebody who wants to put a house on it to some extent. And so bigger recreational tracks, that's not as important. But if you're subdividing into smaller pieces, you have to make sure that they can actually do what they want to do. And a lot of times that's building for us. Yeah, that was uh, an interesting thing that kind of I had this aha moment because I know like in states like Michigan and Florida and Wisconsin and Washington, perk tests are a really big deal. It's the kind of thing that can kill a deal yep. if it doesn't perk. And things like water it's a non-issue. There's tons of water. Like there's so much water, we don't know what to do with it. Whereas in Texas, it's the opposite where perk tests are never an issue and water is always an issue. So, and it's not like, uh, say if there's no water and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Neil, but my understanding is that if you find out there's no water, that doesn't mean you can't subdivide. It just means you're going to have a really hard time selling that. Like, it's almost like, why do all this when you know you're not going to be able to sell it because there's no water, right? Well, to some extent, so it, it all goes down to, are you talking about exempt subdivisions, big parcels, or are mm -hmm. you talking about platted subdivisions? Because big exempt subdivisions, yeah, you're just going to have trouble selling it. No big deal. 
smaller platted subdivisions, the county or the city is going to, uh, you actually have to submit proof that you can get water. And so if you're wanting to take, say, five acres into five one acre lots, just for example, you know, the county is going to want to make sure you can get water and electric access, and they're going to need actual signed documents from your water provider and electricity provider saying they agree to provide water. The answer is it depends, but it, it depends on what kind of subdivision you want to do. I mean, I was, I was talking with a colleague yesterday who was just asking me, hey, can I subdivide this property? What would it look like? And, you know, she was looking at a five acre property, tried to divide it into two or three different lots. And I looked at it pretty quickly and just said, hey, you're not going to be able to do that. She said, well, you know, why, why is that? Well, first off, it doesn't have the road frontage. You need to look at those regulations on why, you know, how much road frontage is needed per lot. You also can't just survey this out with a surveyor. Like you got to get a plat. It's inside city limits. You got to get city approval. You got to run it by them. You got to verify water. You got to verify electric. Sometimes counties will have you verify drainage runoff to make sure you're not going to flood somebody else's property by putting houses there. And so when you do a platted subdivision, which is kind of teetering on major minor, you know, somewhere in there, if you're not doing roads, it's a lot more extensive and you, you really got to know your stuff. Uh, or you need a long due diligence period, you know, to make sure that you don't get stuck with a property you don't want to buy. If you're doing an exempt subdivision where nobody has approvals over it, you're kind of more in the Wild West and you just need a really good real estate agent surveyor. Yeah, this was another huge thing I learned from Neil the first time we talked was when he was explaining this whole exempt subdivision thing about, you know, basically how to find like, what are these rules? When are you exempt from having to go through all these requirements and get county approval? to do this subdivide. And he showed me line by line in the document online, here's where you go do it. And I actually made a video explaining how to do this uh, with Claude, the chat bot. You can probably do it with a lot of different chat bots now, but, and I actually discovered like, it's easier than I thought it was to do this in Michigan, just by following what Neil showed me how to do. Uh, I'll include a link to that in the show notes for this episode, retipster.com forward slash 180. But this kind of goes back to if uh, anybody out there heard the episode with David Hansen in 176, he was explaining like what he has to do is basically read the county's zoning ordinance and rules and all this stuff yeah, and yeah. understand it better than the county does so that he, he is the authority and he knows exactly what he can and can't do. And if people challenge him, he can say, no, your own rules say this. How much time do you have to spend going line by line through county and township and city regulations to understand this stuff? Like, do you not have to do that much anymore because you stick to the same few markets all the time? So we still do it every time. And, and I'll give you an example of why. And the time that we do it is we do it right before we call a county. So especially if we're exploring a new county, I'll read the subdivision guidelines and I'll send my acquisitions guys a summary of what we can do in the county. Because the acquisitions guys are going to be running their after repair value and giving offers based upon the margins we want to hit based upon what's allowed in that county is exempt essentially. And so there's a county in our area in Texas, and there's, there's actually several counties in Texas who can you, you not, not only can do 10 acres, you can also do five acre exempt, sub, exempt subdivisions, which is really neat because especially in areas where there are high demand for that, that's fantastic. And so in this specific county, we put under contract a property that uh, was 25 acres, and our intention was to make five five-acre parcels. Well, in our due diligence process, you know, we originally saw five acres was allowed. Our project manager called the county and the county told him the provision says five acres or greater, or sorry, it says greater than five acres. And oh my gosh, my heart sunk because what they said is we interpret that as 5.01 acres per lot and you have five acres, therefore you cannot do this. <laughs> That killed our deal. I'm, oh my gosh. We, I mean, it's just, it's little things like that that you get the nuances of. And so to answer your question, yeah, we, we absolutely read it every single time because we've also seen other counties that don't even have any subdivision regulations, especially getting out toward West Texas. Um, there are actually quite a few counties that are small enough that they don't want to, <laughs> they don't want the hassle of dealing with your subdivisions. They don't care. And you can do literally whatever you want. And so knowing those subdivision guidelines and knowing which counties you can do what and cannot do what, you could actually make a, and we have, you can make a business and we have made a business 
off of taking advantage of those exceptions and counties that have unique offerings like that. Yeah. Makes you wonder though, like a big component of what makes this work is the fact that there's demand for these newer, smaller parcels that you create and they just kind of sell relatively quickly. If the, the demand suddenly dried up, this would kind of not work anymore, right? In, in a place like West Texas, is there demand for that kind of thing? Like, does it make less sense to do it out there, even though it's easier? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely what you got to watch. You, you've got to know that there's probably a reason that they don't have subdivision regulations. And it's probably because they don't have an issue with it because not many people do it. So on this whole issue of demand and how important that is to this whole strategy of uh, subdividing, whether it's major or minor or exempt, so like, what is the risk that demand would dry up? It seems like this is not a huge risk in Texas, at least in your area, as long as I've been aware of what's going on there. It seems like there's always high demand for it. But say if you're working somewhere else, I look at the six month time frame or maybe the year plus time frame it takes to do this with like a platted subdivision. I don't know. Like, what is the a risk that, okay, and this made sense when we started it, but something changed in the meantime and now it doesn't make sense and they're subdivided. And, you know, is that, is there much of a risk of that or could you catch it before it gets to that point? No, I mean, of course, there's always a risk. Um, the advantage to the model that we do with the minor and exempt subdivisions is that, you know, our contract periods may be only 45 to 60 days. And so from the time we go under contract, you know, if we can't predict the market 45, 60 days out, we're, we're in trouble, you know, and, and nobody can predict what's going to happen. We saw that with 2020. We saw that with 2001, 2008. You know, all the times that the market shifted drastically, very, very quickly, we can't predict the big black swan events per se. Yet, even in events like that, land demand has historically stayed there, especially if you're able to pivot to an owner finance strategy or if you have good capital backing you to where you can make those pivots. And so I'm not necessarily worried too much about that. The people who I think should worry about that are the people who are doing very long term and large scale major subdivisions who from the time they go under contract have to spend a year to maybe 18 months to get approvals for that, you run a massive risk. I mean, imagine, Seth, if you went under contract on a property summer 2021, the absolute peak of the market. When you, and then you look and you had to spend a year, maybe 18 months to get that plotting approval. You know, the market really started dipping April or May 2022 especially in Texas. And so the market that you bought into, and now you did this major subdivision on, things have changed drastically. You spent all this time, all this effort. And so if you didn't have a good contract or you don't have a way to get out of that contract or you don't have you know competent attorneys on, on what you're going to do on that, not to mention the time and money wasted, you know, you could be in for a pretty big loophole <laughs> or a pretty big, uh, pretty big trouble there. So my worry, and that's that's the worry that I have with being a home builder. That's the worry that I have with doing those big subdivisions is, you know, demand can change at the snap of a finger. And if you don't have good, competent, you know, attorneys that can get you out of contracts like that, that could be big trouble for you. But with, with how fast we do things, I'm not as worried about it. Now, going back to something you had said a while back, you were talking about a property like one of the home run deals where you bought it for a million and it's going to sell for two and a half million, I think you said, and it's going to take two and a half Correct. years. Is that? Yes. So why is that taking so long? Like two and a half years is a long time. Like what's going on there? Yeah. And that's, that's probably an overestimation yet. Uh, it it's in, it's outside of city limits yet. It's in a city's ETJ. Have you ever heard of that term? Extraterritorial jurisdiction. And so basically what that means is that the city, and it's a pretty big city in East Texas, has decided that anywhere surrounding us within a certain number of miles influences our city. And so therefore, we're going to have to control what happens in it. And so even though no tax is paid to the city, they still control development in that area. And so you go from, you know, previously being able to maybe do something exempt or dealing specifically with just the county, which is my preference in every circumstance. County is a lot easier to deal with than cities. And now you move it to having to get full approval from a, a relatively large city in East Texas that is known for not being easy to work with. So once you get to that, our process is going to look like listed on market day one with some preliminary marketing materials right after we buy it, spend six months to a year to attract uh, our main goal is RV parks or mobile home park because that mobile home park is next door. 
And so our main objective is to attract a similar investor um, who is going to an end builder or buyer who's going to want to do that. And then we'll partner with them, um, us take on the expense of actually doing the subdivision of the development and go through all the hurdle with the city. And ultimately, probably, I would say six months of back and forth, maybe nine months of back and forth, um, get that approved and get to the closing table. And so that, that's overall a time period of, say, a year and a half, two years to do that. And I went ahead and got a 30-year loan on it. Just, just, just in case, man, you never know what's going to happen. But that's an example of just what I'm being told by a commercial real estate agent that we're going to partner with on the deal and what I've seen other comparables in the market take to actually get full market value. And so a lot of those big subdivision contracts like that the work is not necessarily done until the builder is selected. Very similar to what you said, David had told you, you know, you don't want to get the work done first because, well, what if the builder doesn't like it? Or what if the, you know, what if the person, the end buyer says, well, I would have done this differently. You know, you, you could have a preliminary plan, but you also want to get their input into, because they're the ultimate end buyer. So they need input on how they like to do things. As you were talking there, a thought just came to my mind. I know in, you know, in Texas, the availability of water is a big deal in order to make that property useful. So there are actually some improved property types that don't require water at all. Like I'm thinking about my self-storage facility, like we don't have water there or there's other, uh, you know, solar panel farms and that kind of thing. I wonder if you do come across these, you know, properties that are not worthless, but they're, they're worth less because of the lack of water. I wonder if you could just look at it from those other angles of, well, we couldn't build a house here, but we could do this. Maybe it's useful for that. No, I love that idea. That's a really good idea. I mean, the the challenge with most of the properties that we are doing deals on is that they're in relatively rural locations. And so they're far enough away from a major population center to not make sense for self-storage. Yet solar is absolutely something we're looking into in every single project we go into contract on. And so we go ahead and list that on a service that markets solar listings. We also um, send it out to five or six guys who do solar that I know to get bids. And so, yes, we are actively pursuing those opportunities because they are incredibly lucrative whenever they hit. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't yeah. had one hit yet, but I, I had a friend who had one hit and it's life changing money. Yeah, well, and it's actually... Like you're right about self-storage in terms of like the rural markets and that kind of thing in terms of that playing a part in it. But I, I just, this is, I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but I've been uh, researching, you know, higher end RV and boat storage and that kind of thing where mm -hmm. it's like a mm -hmm. improved garage type thing you store it in. And apparently the population matters a lot less for that. What is important is that the facility is really close to a highway and really close to a gas station where RVs can pull in there and people can, you know, air up their tires and get gas and that kind of thing. And uh, it's kind of opening up my mind a lot because the lens that I've always looked at self-storage through where it's like, okay, there can only be so many square feet, feet per people per person in that area. It's like, throw it all out. doesn't matter. Like all that matters is that it's not all that matters, but the things that do matter is proximity to a highway and that kind of thing. So, but it's it just making me wonder, like, there's probably tons of different uses for certain properties that would otherwise be less useful if you didn't know about what makes a good version of this property use. I don't know if you're able to follow what I'm saying. No, I completely follow you. And I think that's really intelligent. I mean, our ability as land investors to make money is going to be only limited by where we can see the demand. And so you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, whereas I look at a property, I see a really cool subdivide. Somebody else looks at it, sees a major subdivision. Somebody else looks at it, sees an RV park. Somebody else looks at it and sees exactly what you just talked about. You know, everybody has their own playbook that they want to that they want to run. And the more plays that you have in your playbook for whatever situation comes up, the more money you're going to make. Absolutely. I almost wish there was like uh, some kind of an AI thing where you could like plug the property, like upload the data tree profile report. And it could just like, you know, do its magic and think of all the possible uses based on where it is. And I don't think we're there yet, but hopefully someday somebody makes something like that. <laughs> um, so. Uh, Going back to something you said earlier about how, you know, you don't even start by offering these people at 50%. Like you get laughed out for being offered 90%. So, you know, that, you know, implies that the conversation starts with a pretty high offer and you go up from there or the deal just dies. So what if you did 
start by offering 50%, knowing that you won't get the deal then, but like, you're going to have to go up and up and up, but at least you're like anchoring them at that lower price instead of just anchoring them at a 90% price. I mean, I'm kind of with you. Like, I, I think I would be doing the same thing you do. Like once I get laughed at by enough people, I would just stop trying, but I don't know. What if, what if you did? Would that make any difference? Do you think? Yeah, we, so we started off the first three months of last year when we were doing cold calls. Uh, we started off at offering um, 65, went up to 75% of market value. The challenge was is that we didn't get any deals within three months. And as soon as we started evaluating these properties differently, we started calculating our offers based upon ARV in a, in a gross profit margin versus current market value and just offering, you know, say 65, 75% of it. That's when our acquisitions really took off and we started putting under contract a lot of properties. And so, you know, out of the 15 deals that we closed last year, a majority of those were last six months and most of them were last 90 days of the year. And so our acquisitions ramp up and, and now we also were doing more phone calls. So, you know, it's and also cold calling takes a long time to ramp up as, as far as actually starting to get those under contract. Um, it's a little bit may, maybe mail's the same. I'm not as familiar with it, but it takes a while. It's interesting to think about, you know, what ifs I, I can just tell you what we've done and I can tell you starting off that low did not work for us. Now, we're always trying to get prices out of people before we tell them our price, of course. And we're actually pretty successful at it, probably 90% of the time. The issue is that, you know, say a property is worth, I don't know, 300,000, you know, people are telling us they want 400. Don't call us back unless you can get me 400. And we'll call them back and offer them 200 and they'll say, I told you not to call me back. <laughs> you know, I mean, it doesn't mean we don't call them back, but it's just, yeah. you know, here's how our offer is calculated. Here's how we see it. Here's the potential in the property and just not resonate, not hidden. And so that's the difficulty. Um, is there any merit to offering 50% in these areas? Hey, man, I'm, I'm sure that there are other people who are buying deals at 50% in these areas. Uh, for some reason, that's just not us, though. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's almost like, uh, um, you know, when you said originally you started at 65, then you went to 75% you weren't getting deals. Again, this is a what if game. This is probably pointless to even ask this, but like, what if you started at 50% knowing I can go up to 100% and it can still work, but I'm still going to start at 50%. I'm going to make them think that that's, you know, a valid starting point. And I know they'll say no, but we'll go to 65. We'll go to 75. We'll go to 80. I, I wonder if you might end up in a lower place as a result of starting so much lower. It's a good perspective and it definitely be something I'm willing to try. I don't have any guess to what would happen. All I can say is when we tried something similar previously, it ultimately led to less conversions. I mean, it, the difficult thing is, I mean, some of the more recent properties we're buying are actually up in the, you know, 600,000, 800,000, a million. For properties like that, obviously you got a, you got a pretty good offer on there. I mean, the, Overall, I think there's two factors that contribute to why, why we have to offer so much. So one is that we're dealing with extremely sophisticated sellers. You know, they own assets worth three, five, seven hundred thousand million. Absolutely more sophisticated than the person who owns a fifty thousand dollar piece of land. There's no doubt. And so with sophistication, I believe comes a higher price. Um, and then two, with the demand and the growth in this area, the other problem that we hear a lot is um, that, hey, I just got a mailer and my mailer offer was 350000 when we can maybe only offer, I don't know, three fifty as well. But they're like, yeah, I, w I wouldn't take three fifty. And so the, I can tell you for a fact that there are other people in Texas doing the same thing that we're doing who are blasting people before we get to them with cold calls, but they're blasting them with mailers. But the people that we get would say, oh, I'd never, I'd never call a mailer. I'd never talk to somebody who sent me mail, but you're really a nice guy. So I'd rather sell it to you. I can hear you. I can see that you're trustworthy. And so that's why we like cold calling, but it's, it's an interesting thing. Do you ever do seller financing? Like, I know you get bank financing a lot, but do, so like what percentage of your deals that you buy end up going the seller financing route? Not many, unfortunately. That is something that we're looking to implement more of this year. We just put a property under contract yesterday on seller financing. 
Um, so that was an excellent deal for us. And then we bought another, we bought one more last year. And so I'm thinking in terms of probably like one out of 20, one out of 30. So yeah, I mean, 5% or less for seller finance. Yeah, we're actually, we're selling, we're selling more on dispositions on seller finance more than we're acquiring on seller finance. Yeah, And yeah. so, and I love holding those notes that we'll do that all day. Do you prefer to do that on the disposition end? Like if you could have your choice, would you rather do seller financing or do you want to get cash first if you could? No, I'd get cash first. I, I So as we kind of talked earlier, I'm I'm in the building phase. And so I'm looking to scale as quickly as possible. And so the thing that is holding me back from scaling is absolutely access to capital. 1,000%. And and I know that I could probably get unlimited capital at say fifty percent profit split or mm -hmm. you know whatever profit yeah. split it would be it would not be hard to find, but I'd rather take the full profit and and fund it here and try to scale up a little bit slower, but albeit build up a much bigger capital stack a year or two from now. So that's what I'm trying to build up. You know who knows what's going to happen in this market and this economy with this year coming up, and so I'm just trying to build up capital stack to go to town when something happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that well, makes sense. Now, I think you said you did about 15 of these deals this past year. Is that right? Correct. Yep. So, so like, how much are you making doing this? Our average profit last year per deal was 150000 And that's gross. That's not net. That's gross. But that's mm -hmm. after all, like, cost of goods sold and everything before staff. Um, and then our median profit's about one hundred and ten. And so, you know, some of those skewed a little bit higher, but we're we're making about a hundred thousand dollars per property that we do. Uh, we are very very fortunate to have a very high net profit last year, you know, over seven figures. And looking forward to this next year, um, try to do the exact same thing and and maybe double or triple that. And so th the craziest thing is that, I mean, we really full focus on on this. What was May of last year? Um, that that's a full six months ago. Now, we had had some success in land before that and subdividing before that, yet I have never seen an opportunity like this. Being a realtor is a fantastic income opportunity. It's not necessarily where I want to be forever. Being a house flipper was a fantastic income opportunity, yet it was very difficult compared to land flipping. And doing these subdivides and doing these land flips, I mean, drastically easier than being a realtor or being a house flipper and i'm making three to four times the net like net profit on every single land flip that we did on every single house flip that we did and and when we put it like that i mean it's just it's no comparison and, and a lot of people hey you know you and me included are saying hey it's getting competitive there's a lot of people out there you know we're having to decrease our margins but I hope what people are taking away from today, and one of the reasons I wanted to get together with you, Seth, again, and talk about this, is there's more than one way to do this game. And as things get more competitive, we have to find ways to add value to properties. The days of offering 30% on a, or 50% on a $200,000 property, buying it for seventy dollars to $100,000 in my market area are long gone. And so if you want to work in extremely high demand areas, you've got to find ways to add value to properties that nobody else is looking at, whether that's building self-storage like you did, Seth, whether that's subdividing properties like I'm doing, or whether that's doing major platting, major, what, whatever you're doing, you got to be adding plays to your playbook or else this competition is going to get you. Yeah, man. No, I totally agree with that. That's... That's uh, do you ever think about, or does it ever seem enticing to like, maybe I should go to a less demand, less competition area where it's easier to buy deals, but maybe takes longer to sell. Like, does, it ever, does that thought ever cross your mind? Or is it like, no, I prefer the high competition difficulty of finding deals, low market value. And I prefer being able to sell them in a good amount of time. I mean, I've heard from several people that a land investor the land investor's biggest struggle is selling properties and selling them quickly. Uh, a lot of times acquisitions- Sounds like the opposite with, for you, right? Yeah, it is. And so that's what I'm very fortunate. And so with me being a realtor and me having access to MLS and all these areas that I work in, 
Um, and us having an operations team behind the scenes, you know, with a full time person here and then also a, a, a VA in the Philippines. With us having that kind of support, our disposition effort, I mean, maybe takes me a handful of hours a week um, to be able to sell these properties. And that's not an exaggeration. It does not take long or much effort from me. And so that's awesome. I would rather have that disposition's effort and have the ability be or have the hardship be on acquisitions. Because once I sell some of these properties, get some capital back, I'll just reinvest it in the acquisitions. And so I would prefer a market that is fiercely competitive to where I can do these subdivides and I can just keep on funneling acquisitions, 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 and then selling them pretty easy. And so now I will say it also doesn't make sense. So like we don't target, for instance, like a Dallas County, a Tarrant County, uh, Dallas and Fort Worth, Collin County, like McKinney, like we don't target these suburban areas either. So like there comes a point where too much demand is too much demand. So, you know, we have found some sweet spots in some counties that have less demand. But for me, in the most rural areas we work at, which would be, say, two and a half hours away from from Dallas, you can still have 10 to 20 acre properties selling in a month or two. That's considered slow in a lot of areas, maybe three months, four months, worst case. And so it's hard to find an area in, in North Dallas or North Texas or East Texas that doesn't have a ferocious demand for land. It's, it's actually, it's hard to find. Do you know Logan Fulmer? I've heard his name. Yeah. Yeah. So we interviewed him, I think it was episode 177. And he goes after properties in Texas that have a lot of title issues, like intentionally going after them and fixes yeah, the title that's where issues. I know. Sometimes yeah. it takes years. Yeah, but, but one of the th examples that he talked about recently was he bought a landlocked parcel in Texas for 5,000 bucks and then sued for access, put a road into it, that all of that cost him like 150 grand, and then he sold it for $500,000. I wonder, is there a lot of landlocked property in Texas near your area? I wonder if that might be a way of somehow seeking, seeking out the landlocked ones, even though it's a huge pain and you know a lot of cost to build a road to it, like maybe it's still worth it. If it uh, makes you come out ahead, my I mean, my objective, and this is kind of a recurring thing that we've talked about a little bit, is it's a good idea. There's no doubt. Just like major plotting is a good idea. Just like building a self storage facility is a good idea. My priority right now is scaling, and the only way that I scale is to build my capital stack. And so my my full like blinders and my full focus is on how can I make you know, 30% gross profit margin per project. In addition to that, how can I get my capital back within six months? And so as long as those two things run true, it's the project for me. Now, with that Tyler, or with that one in the city, uh, the, one, the million dollar one, hey, I'm okay to hit a home run every once in a while. I'll take on a project that's two or three years. Yet, that's going to be the exception. And, you know, and, and maybe that's me being stubborn and saying, I don't want to take on partners. I previously had a partnership with flipping houses. It was, it was a thriving partnership. Yet I, I got really, really tired really quick of giving away high profit splits. And so um, at, at this point, I'm trying to get capital back as soon as possible. Because also you asked earlier about markets changing and things like that. The slower your capital comes back, the more risk you have. and so. I, I would love to be able to do exactly what Logan's talking about. And, and I have watched some stuff with him on it. He's a pretty impressive guy. His stuff takes a while in a lot of circumstances. And yeah. my hesitancy at this point for doing those things that take a while is we, we're buying a lot of real estate and I need that capital back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, need, we need the money. We need the money to scale and grow. And so that's, that's probably where we're kind of in the messy middle of where a business growth is. Like we're getting to that point, like we're, we're growing, we've got, you know, five full-time employees who help us do all this. And so like, we've got to be able to grow in order to grow. We got to get capital back. Long story short. A while back, you had talked about how a lot of the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. But you <laughs> talked about how a lot of these uh, parcels that you're buying, they're owned by sophisticated sellers who like own a bunch of other stuff and they're not really motivated to sell and that kind of thing. So why do you think that is? 
Like, where are these people where it's like, yeah, I inherited this from my grandpa 20 years ago and I don't care about it. Like, wh- why aren't you finding those people? Is it because those are the people that own the tinier, smaller rinky dink lots that nobody cares about? And when you get to a higher dollar range, I found this a lot with farmland too. Um, even, you know, five plus years ago, like when a property is worth a lot, and especially when it's making money for somebody, they have zero reason to sell that thing at any kind of a discount. Is it just because of the caliber of property you're working with? Like, would you find this everywhere throughout the country where the sellers are kind of sophisticated and they're not motivated? Uh, I'm going to purely speculate on this. My speculation is that once you have a property worth a certain amount, and once they've owned it for a certain time period and they realize it's worth that amount, and, and especially all of these properties we've bought, almost every single property we deal with is ag exempt. And in the in the state of Texas or the counties that we deal in, the average tax bill for these properties is $30 a year. And so, and, and I'm sure that that's pretty similar other places in the nation. I don't, I don't know if Texas is unique in that, but that's what I see. And so you've got these owners and most of the properties that we have bought have been inherited. And so that is a key factor for us that we know that somebody could be motivated to sell from that. And that's where we get a lot of our deals from. Now, the difficult part is they just don't have any reason to sell. And I'm, I'm surprised and, I, and I'm mesmerized. I, I ask our acquisitions guys, how is it possible that this many people own this many properties? You know, we, we've called, gosh, I don't remember, 130,000 properties last year or something like that. How is it that these many properties and this many people don't want to cash out of their, say, six-figure land investment that they have with probably 90% of them being paid off? How is that possible? And and I think the reality is that they don't have any reason to sell. And so a lot of them look at it as an investment um, that has performed at almost a 50 to 100% return over the last five years. So why would I sell it to you? <laughs> that's a lot of what we get. Um, now... In other, so like that's in the growing areas. You go out to a little bit of West Texas, which we've prospected a little bit to. There are areas out there that have not grown in value at all in the last three years. They were worth a hundred thousand, and they are still worth a hundred thousand. The difficulty there is that people would take a hundred thousand, but we can't pay a hundred thousand because we can't make money <laughs> on mm, subdivides yeah. in areas that have no demand or price appreciation. And so we've kind of taken a lot of those counties out because, and some people over there were upside down, which is something I'd never seen. And this is probably three to five hours away to the west of DFW. But there are people out there who are thriving doing some division stuff. It's it's interesting that everybody has different models. Everybody has different ways of doing things. But my my theory on sophisticated sellers is it's about price. It's about price and holding cost. And that's it. Yeah, gotcha. Um, So... As we kind of wrap this thing up, just two quick, maybe long questions. So tell me about your disposition process. You're a licensed agent. Are you listing and selling all these properties yourself? Or are you ever getting other agents to do that for you? Or what is your involvement in that? Yeah, so our we're very fortunate in the fact that our MLS access, I mean, covers all the way from like Abilene in the west, which is three hours away, Oklahoma in the north, Waco in the south, and then like Tyler all the way to Louisiana in the east. And so, and, it, and if you were to look at that on a map, I mean, that's just probably the size of some states, to be honest. I mean, that's a huge market area. That's three hours every direction. And so we are blessed in the fact that I can sell all of those properties because I have competency in these areas and because we have MLS access there to where I can easily list them. And so, yeah, our dispositions process is that the only work that I do on files as a real estate agent or in transactions as a real estate agent is essentially just handle the sales portion of it. So, you know, I'll answer the calls, I'll negotiate with the offers, you know, the normal thing a real estate agent would do, but we've got back office administration to input the listing, schedule the photos, um, do the due diligence, market the property, send out our, you know, marketing emails, post it on Facebook. I mean, you name it. And so that's how disposition takes such little amount of my time because the time that I'm doing disposition is literally just me negotiating. 
um, with potential with potential buyers or real estate agents who want to bring buyers. And so, yeah, I mean, that's we've got the system to do it, and we help out other land investors who want to do it as well. I mean, looking at it from your perspective, just given that built-in advantage you have in Texas, I mean, that would make me not want to go anywhere else. I mean, that's just a really nice uh, thing to have on your side. Whereas if you go to some other state and all of a sudden you don't ha have all the info or it's not so easy to sell, or you got to pay somebody else. It's like, I don't know if I like that. I mean, is that part of what's keeping you right there in Texas? It is because, I mean, if you look at, I mean, our purchase volume in, in what we bought last year, or I'll just tell you what, we contracted on 5 million of real estate last year. And so with us contracting on that much real estate, if we were to pay a real estate agent, you know, 3% as a seller's agent on $5 million, gosh, I mean, the, the fees on that would be outrageous. And so I, I, I had looked at, I had looked at bringing on somebody on staff specifically to sell our properties, which I'm still looking into and will probably execute on this year. But I mean, me doing it myself is a full six figure savings, you know, $150,000 yeah, um, of savings that I get by just listing the properties myself. And I still pay a buyer's agent. We still pay them, you know, a full commission on that. So I don't save a full six. I end up only saving three yet. I've got negotiated agreements with title companies, you know, negotiated agreements with surveyors, et cetera, all down the line that my real estate business fuels along with my land investing business. And so it, it all goes together. And, you know, I've being a real estate agent, long story short, it, it really, really helps out disposition efforts drastically. The only hindrance is for that cost savings. Obviously, I've got to do a lot more work and I've got to have the operational support to be able to do that. But I've got immense control and immense, you know, confidence on whenever we buy a property that it's going to sell because. I've sold other people's properties in this area. You know, I, I know what the demand is going to look like. Long story short. Have you ever had a deal to date where you've like lost money on it? Like doing all this work and it fell apart? No, mm -mm, I haven't. And, you know, some people could, could say, well, hey, he's not being aggressive enough. <laughs> if you haven't lost money yet. I've lost money in house flips. I'll tell you that. Um, we lost, we did about 50 of them um, from 2020 to 2023. We lost money on two of them as the market shifted in late 2022 going into about a year ago and that was part of the reason that i was like hey I, I need to do something new you know i can't be subject to this kind of market because the crazy thing is land land didn't lose anything land didn't lose any steam now it didn't have the crazy price appreciation jump that the houses did but it also didn't have the fall that the houses did so land just kind of went smooth, you know, smooth up. It, yeah. it went up in value for sure, but it went up very smoothly. But now the the lease that we made on a property is about twenty five thousand, and then the second lease is going to be closer to six figures than last year. Wow, man, that's awesome! You got a great business going. Yeah, yeah, very fortunate. Well, it's, just, it's interesting to to because I mean I know early in this conversation you were saying like. We kind of didn't expect it to be this hard. Like we sort of thought it'd be easier. And like, I totally get that. It sounds like the acquisition side definitely is harder given where you're at, but at the same time, it's also awesome. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. just interesting to contrast those two things. It kind of, it says a lot about every other business out there. That's just normal businesses where the mar margins are way thinner and there's a lot more risk and just a lot more, but side comment. Yeah. So, it's, it's interesting to some extent acquisitions for house flipping was easier. I, I will say that. Dispositions was harder. Acquisitions was easier for land because you could find distressed people. And so that, that was the difference is that the, the distress was so much more apparent. Uh, it was very easy to see. It was easier to find. And a large portion of my house flipping business came from partnering and teaching real estate agents who then brought uh, distressed deals. But my challenge was we had to reinvent the model from going from house flipping to land flipping because the relationships I had with agents, well, they didn't do land. And they maybe came across one land listing a year versus, you know, they'd be selling 10 houses. So just statistically, my referral base got lost. And so we had to restart and we had to do a lot of cold calls. We made, yeah, 130, 140,000 cold calls um, just in the last year from two Americans dialing spent almost a thousand hours talking to people on the phone, talking to tens of thousands of people 
you know, just to get 15 deals. And, you know, and, and maybe somebody who runs a cold calling operation would, you know, comment on that and be like, oh, that's nothing. We do a lot more than that. But I think that there's a lot of people out there who truly just have no earthly idea, just like maybe I did last year, how much effort it will take to get even just one land deal, not to mention like one a month or two a month. It's going to take some sweat. <laughs> it's going to either that or money, sweat or money, one of the two. Yeah, well, I mean, to some extent, when you find these properties that like fit the exact profile that you need it to fit in and you know you can push these buttons and it'll come out the other end worth a lot more, like you have everything else lined up as long as the property looks somewhat perfect coming in. I mean, in a sense, you're almost like looking around for gold nuggets on the ground. It's like, yeah, those are going to be hard to find. But when you find them, mm-hmm. they're worth a whole yep. lot. So it almost kind of... uh like if you weren't so particular about it, this probably would be way easier. And I think that's probably why it is a bit easier for people who aren't that particular about it, who aren't trying to subdivide and they don't need it to fit all these parameters. Like you're just a lot more, it's basically like a different business model really than land flipping because I mean, it's almost like a, a house flip in a sense, right? Because you're you're getting your hands dirty, so to speak, in terms of like putting a lot of effort into making the thing worth a lot more. Whereas with just a straight land flip, like none of that is required. I agree with you completely. Yep. It's, yeah. you know, one of, one of the things that I guess we're proud of or that we talk about around the office is, you know, we're playing a different game. You know, we, we office out of a realtor's office and, you know, we're doing land investing. And like, they thought we were crazy when we were doing house flipping. I think we're even more crazy now that we're doing like these land subdivisions. And, you know, it takes a while for everybody to kind of catch on and be like, Maybe there's something to what he's doing. You know, <laughs> may, you know, he, he yeah. seemed kind of crazy about this land stuff. And he seemed kind of crazy about this house flips and these rental properties and stuff. You know, maybe there's actually something to this. Maybe he actually does know what he's doing. And, you know, all the while, we're just hustling, hustling, hustling. And so one of the things that I guess we pride ourselves on, even when we were doing house flips, we would do, we would do mobile homes. We would do lar- large acreage properties with houses on them. One of the biggest opportunities, I think, in any business is to go after opportunities that nobody else is paying attention to. And so, therefore, you kill the competition because nobody else is paying attention. Before we wrap this up, I just want to touch on this, uh, the cold calling operation you've got. Before we hit record, Mm -hmm. you would tell me that you've basically never really done direct mail in a big way, which is very different Mm -hmm. than most land investors. Most people start there. And if it doesn't work, they start exploring other stuff. But it sounds like you started with cold calling. And that's pretty much the main thing you do. Um, and, uh, yeah, just tell me about that. Like, as you mentioned earlier, you got two Americans dialing, like, what do you like, dislike about it? This is probably a whole separate conversation. I'm sure we could take a long time about this, but like, would you recommend yeah. people do this kind of thing or what are the drawbacks and the advantages of it? I mean, the draw the drawback is getting people willing to do it. I mean, that that's the whole night. That's the whole difficulty. And especially if you are not in the position to have a team, um, for you doing it yourself of doing cold calling. I was brought up in the business of cold calling. Um, some of my previous history, even before real estate, um, was in cold calling operations and, and scripting and some things like that for some unique businesses. And so um, that's really how I built uh, a previous business to real estate. That's how I built my realtor business. That's how I built my mortgage business when I was in it. And so to transfer that over, my house flipping business was not built upon cold calling. It was built upon agent referrals and was pretty darn successful at that. And then to move into land flipping and I think, hey, well, we're just going to do the agent referral game. And, you know, it's took off at house flipping. So why would not take off on land flipping? It didn't take off. And so I had to go back to essentially the only thing that I knew, uh, which is cold calling. And at the time we had a realtor on our team who, you know, wanted to get more on the investment side. And so I said, tell you what, how about you do this? And then he had a buddy that he was like, hey, I think this guy would be good at doing this too. And so we, we just brought those two guys on and they just started making calls. And, you know, one of the themes of this past year for us would absolutely be just be iteration just from, you know, changing things around to how we say it versus what we say. Um, I'll give you an example. For instance, we used to ask if people wanted to offer, uh, if people wanted an offer on their property. Um, now we ask if people want to sell their property. And the reasoning behind that is that people, if you ask if somebody wants an offer, they typically tell you some outrageous number because it's, I don't know, take an offer. Versus if you ask somebody if they want to sell, they actually try to tell you their motivation. And so we got less leads, but we got higher quality leads. So little, little nugget for you there. 
but yeah, I I like cold calling because you can see the fruit of your efforts very quickly. You can track the amount of calls, you can track the conversations, you can track the leads, and you can start putting in offers today. And, and there's not really much prep work other than downloading data, maybe filtering out just a little bit of LLCs or whatever else you don't want to call. And then it's uploaded, it's in the dialer, and you're off running. So if you want to talk about the lowest cost way to get up and going as a land investor, it's absolutely cold calling. Yet it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of sweat, it takes a lot of hustle. And also, in my opinion, and you tell me if I'm wrong on this or right, I would imagine that most land investors do direct mail and not cold call. And yeah, so, so at least that's where they yeah. start. Yeah. So how do you stand how do you stand out? Right. So if if this person's getting five pieces of mail and you're the only one who calls, even if you have the exact same number, you're probably gonna get the deal. The other thing is for me, I have them on site. So I have an office that we rent. So we have to have a place to have them. We got to pay for the dialing software, got to pay for the data, um, et cetera. And so I, I don't think, based upon all the numbers that I see and their commissions and splits and everything, I wouldn't say cold calling is necessarily cheaper overall. Leveraged as a team than mailing is probably about the same cost. Um, yet I do believe cold calling is going to have a better return just because it's voice to voice. Is there a reason you don't uh, hire like a calling agency? Is it because you just know it that well? Like it's kind of a, a waste to do that because you have so much expertise built in? I haven't done it yet. The good, Okay, so the good news about the model that we have been running is that obviously it had incredible success relatively quick. The bad news is that's kind of a um, kind of wants to keep you there. <laughs> you know, it's almost like mm -hmm. we got yeah. there doing this. The profit margins from, you know, gross to net profit are just superb compared to any other business I've ever run or seen. Uh, very low operating costs. And so it's like, you know, I could continue to run the business that I have with these two guys cold calling and the operational staff that we have, you know, make what I'm making and everything would be great. The other hurdle is the cash return from the properties that we are buying. Uh, I mean, at this point on the properties that we own, you know, we're getting close to like high six figures, seven figures of capital of my own money plus investors money tied up in the deals that we even just bought and bought leveraged, you know, via loans from banks. And so before we pour gas on the fire, we've got to have the capital base. And so that's the answer, that's probably the better answer to your question is why don't we have any virtual call center? Why don't we do any of that? Because we need the capital back to be able to support our operations further. Uh, I'll give you a third piece on that. The third piece is that I will always bet on an American cold caller versus a virtual cold caller, you know, to get deals. And um, I truly believe that there's a big difference between those two. And I think anybody who's used American cold callers will agree with that. And I do believe ultimately American cold callers will be more profitable versus going a VA route and, and will get more deals and get more lucrative deals. Uh, now, the extra hassle is kind of the question that everybody wants to know is, is it worth it? I mean, to me, it's worth it because I've experienced on it, but to a brand new person, probably not. Yeah, that's fascinating. There's a ton more I could ask about that, but I'll bring this to a close. We've been talking for a long time. I appreciate your time so much, Neil. By sure. the way, if, if anybody out there wants to hear a much more in-depth conversation. It was actually the first conversation I ever had with Neil. I happened to record it for myself and it was so good. I was like, Neil, can I use this and put this in the Land Elite Masterclass? <laughs> and he said, sure. And it's, it's an awesome conversation. I learned a ton from him. It's part of the Land Elite Masterclass, landeliteMasterclass.com. If you want to check that out, that conversation is in there along with several others about subdividing and a lot of other advanced next level stuff for land investors. Neil, if people want to find out more about you or I don't know, I'll reach out to you. You don't have to share anything, but if, uh, if you want to, where should they go? What should they do? Sure, absolutely. Uh, you're more than welcome to email me, neil at theclimgroup.com um, or go to our website, clemgroup.com. Uh, you'll see a real estate facing website. Um, it's, a, it's our real estate uh, company there, uh, but you can reach out to me through there um, and my phone number's on there if anybody needs anything. So I'm an open book. I'm happy to help and uh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Seth. Awesome. I'll include links to all that stuff and many other things that we talked about throughout this conversation in the show notes. Again, retipster.com forward slash 180, 180. Neil, thanks again, man. Hopefully we'll talk again soon. Appreciate you.